All right, welcome to Learn SDR with Prof. Jason. Today we're going to talk about linear feedback shift registers, gold codes, and how these are used in the GPS system. By the end of the lesson, we'll be able to actually have a GPS antenna that receives data from GPS satellites. And you're not going to get as far as figuring out where you are on the Earth. You'll at least see the incoming bits and, uh, and see the Doppler shift of the satellite. So what is a linear feedback shift register? Well, here's, I'll, I'll proceed by example. Um, an example of a three-bit linear feedback shift register is the following. Well, first you start with a shift register, and if you've taken any digital electronics or uh, computer architecture type classes, a shift register is a bunch of registers. So I'm gonna call this one register one, register two. So these are single bit memory elements, register three. And when the clock comes, they take their input and copy it to the output. And so a shift register is connecting all of these in a row so that when a clock comes, all the data, all the bits move over by exactly one unit. And what we're going to do is we are going to take this output of the last one as our output bit, but we need something to put in the first one. And what we're going to put in the first one is a combination of output number two and output number three for this example. And what we're going to do is we're going to exclusive OR these together. There's an exclusive OR gate. And that is what is going to be fed back into the input of the first one. So let me remind you how an XOR works and how we're going to treat it in this example. So if I have A and B, and the XOR of A and B. The truth table for this, let me just write, A can be either zero or one, and B can be zero, one, or zero, ones is all possible combinations. So it's only high if one or the other are one, otherwise it's zero. So zero, here one of them is high, one, here one of them is high, one, here they're both high, so it's zero. And you can think about this in, in the following way. If one of the inputs is zero, the other input just gets copied over. So this is just a copy of B. And if one of the inputs is one, the input gets inverted to the output. This is just B bar. And that's how we'll think about this XOR gate. So um, it will invert one of the input, uh, it will invert one of the inputs if the other input is high. It's probably the easiest way to think about it in this example. So let's write a table of all the possible states that this goes through. Now, one thing you need to know about these things is if these all start out in the zero state, well, XOR, zero XOR, anything else is gonna be zero. If they all start out in the zero state, then you're gonna be feeding back zeros and nothing will ever happen. So this is the one state that's not allowed is the all zero state. And by tradition, usually these start in the all ones state. So the state, state of registers one, two, and three, we're gonna start it in the all ones state, one, one, one. And this feedback XOR, so this is um, XOR, this is gonna be the exclusive OR of these last two. So these are both one, so the exclusive OR is zero. Now what's gonna happen when the clock hits and everything shifts over? Well, the one is just gonna go into the two, the two is just gonna go into the three, the three is gonna fall off the end of the, the row. And what's gonna come into the one is this. So the first thing that happens is one gets this output of the XOR, um, and then the one shifts over and two shifts over. And now we have to calculate the XOR again. So it's the same thing, XOR one XOR one is zero. And that's gonna become our new input for one and everything else just shifts over. So this zero is gonna shift over, so one's going to shift over. Now we have an XOR of zero and one, which is one. And that's going to become our new input. Everything's going to shift over. Zero is going to shift over. This zero is going to shift over. And uh, our new XOR is going to be zero. XOR of zero and zero is zero. Then this is going to become our new input. Everything's going to shift over. That one moves here. That zero moves there. And new XOR is one. Uh, this becomes our new input. Everything shifts over. 0, 1, 1, uh, 1, 
This one moves over to be a one, this moves over to be a zero, one. And now what you see is that we have a one from here and then the ones both move over. And now we've started the cycle again. So now our state of our registers is one, one, one. So the process repeats. And we just keep doing that over and over and over again. Now, there's some properties here that I wanna emphasize before I sort of talk about it. And these are properties that will generalize to all possible versions of these linear feedback shift registers with a maximal length feedback, which are the only ones that are really interesting for us. Um, the properties are that we've gone through every single state except the all zero state. And if there are three registers, two to the three is eight. That means we should have gone through seven states. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We went through seven. There are no repeats. We have all of the binary numbers here, a one through seven. Uh, and the, the states have gone through every possible state. The output, which is number three here, that is the sequence of numbers that we're gonna spend a bunch of time talking about here. So this has a lot of nice properties. And the nice properties are that uh, it's balanced, which means that it has just as many zeros as ones. Or of course it has, it's an odd, there's an odd number of states, so it has to have one more of something than the other. And since we don't have the all zero state, that's gonna have one more one than zeros. Um, this isn't that impressive when there are only seven states, but when we go to longer shift registers, like the 10-bit shift registers in GPS or 16 or 32 or 128-bit shift registers, um, the fact that you get a balanced sequence that's only off by one is, is more interesting. And the most important property is that the circular correlation of this sequence, the circular autocorrelation of the sequence is really nice. And I'll, I'll talk about what that means and why it's so nice. So let me, let, me, uh, let me erase this. Actually, before I do that, let me say one more thing. This scheme here comes from what's called a feedback polynomial. So the feedback polynomial for this, this register here, so feedback polynomial, for this particular setup here is written as x to the three plus x to the two plus one. And what this means is that you take the XOR of the third register and the second register. And why it's written this way, why it's a polynomial, this has to do with the um, abstract algebra that's used to derive properties of these things. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not gonna get into that, I'll just, list some of the properties. Um, let me show you if, you, if you just Google LFSR, the first thing that comes up is the Wikipedia entry for linear feedback shift registers. And here they have a picture of two different kinds of linear feedback shift registers, this kind and that kind. We'll talk about that in a second. They also have a table of some common polynomials. So if you want a three-bit shift register, here's a common polynomial to use. And those are the taps that you would pick off. And if you wanted to do a 10-bit linear feedback shift register, here's an example of a polynomial. These are not unique. 16-bit, um, you'd have to pick off several and XOR them all together. Uh, but uh, this is not a bad description of what's going on here. All right, what do I mean by the circular autocorrelation? Well, first thing when we calculate any of these things is we're gonna turn a sequence of bits into plus ones and minus ones. So you're gonna turn zeros into say minus one and one into plus one. Uh, you could do, do it in the other way. It actually doesn't affect this. And uh, doing it the other way has some nice properties of turning XORs into multiplications. But let me just talk about this. So, so what, is a, uh, what is a correlation of two things? Well, if you have two sequences, let's say you have sequence X1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn. And for us, these are all gonna be numbers that are either plus one or minus one because they're the output of that last register. And you have y1, y2, y3, all the way up to yn. And for us, n is always going to be the number of items in the sequence. So we had a three-bit register. That means that there were 
two to the three or eight possible states. The all zero state is not allowed. So there's seven states. So for us, we're going to correlate seven things. Uh, we'll do another example of a 10 bit uh, register. And for that, two to the 10 is 1024. And that means it goes through 1023 different states. So n would be 1023 for that example. Let me just write uh, how would we arrange these in a circle? I'm just going to arrange them x1, x2, x3 all the way around a circle to xn. And I'm going to arrange these x to them, y1, y2, y3, all the way around the circle to yn. Once we have these arranged like this, what does a correlation do? Well, a correlation would take each individual pair and multiply it together and then add up all the products. And so if you imagine this is just a sequence of plus ones and minus ones, the multiplications are pretty simple. And then adding them all up, you, you could get some big number or some little number, whether they cancel or not. Um, what's nice about these linear feedback shift registers with these maximal length sequences that we've been describing is if you do that, when you arrange them like this, in the uh, you take you take your sequence and you take another copy of the sequence. So instead of x's and y's, I just have x's and and x's around the circle. Um, obviously, whether I have plus one times plus one or minus one times minus one, the products are all one. And then I add them all up all the way around the circle, and the number I'm going to get is just the number of entries in this. So for the example I did on the board, it'll be uh, seven, eight, eight minus one is seven. Uh, for the GPS example, what I'm going to do next, it'll be two to the 10 minus one or 1023. Now, this is just the correlation at a particular shift. To, to get the full correlation, I want to do all possible shifts. So I'm going to take this inner circle, I'm going to shift it by one. And when I shift it by one, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to say, okay, for shift one, I'm going to multiply every pair and then add them all up. I'm going to do a shift two, multiply every pair, add them all up, record that. Shift three, multiply every pair, add them all up, record that. And then I have um, you know, the, the number of shifts is the same as the length of these sequences. So in the example I gave, again, it was seven. The GPS example is going to be uh, 1,023. Uh, what's nice about these linear feedback shift registers is that when you have zero shift, the correlation is the length of the sequence. Seven, the previous example, 1023 in the case of GPS. Every possible other shift is gonna give you the least possible correlation you could achieve. And since there's an odd number here of zeros and ones, the least possible thing you could achieve is in magnitude is gonna be either plus one or minus one. And just the way the, the math works out, you're gonna get a minus one correlation for every other possible shift. So, so this is great because when there's no shift, it's maximally correlated, and every other possible shift has the minimum possible magnitude of correlation, correlation of minus one. And why is this useful? Well, the circular correlation itself is not always the most, uh, most relevant. But let me show you how, when you have a sequence that repeats, thinking about the circular correlation is the right, the right way to go. So imagine I have a sequence that's that's, say, in the GPS example, it's going to be 10, 23 long. And then I'm going to repeat that sequence. I have another 10, 23 block of sequence. And I have another 10, 23 block of sequence. And now I'm going to do a linear correlation of this, not a circular correlation, with a sliding window that's 10, 23 long. And for a linear correlation, I do the same thing. For every little shift, I'll multiply pairwise, add them all together. That'll be for one shift. I'll shift it over by one, multiply every pair together, and add them up. Shift it over by one, multiply every pair together, add them up. And I'm going to slide this over. And notice that if, if I have a sequence that repeats and I do this linear correlation, I could keep sliding forever. But each little linear correlation is like a circular correlation. I'm going to take the end of this part and the beginning of this red part. Uh, and and uh, correlate it with with the sliding sequence. So 
Um, these circular correlations are useful to think about when you have sequences that repeat. And they're also extremely efficient to compute using uh, some optimized techniques with Fourier transforms that I'll show you when we get to the flow graph. All right, so let's talk about the linear feedback shift registers that the GPS system uses. And there are two. There's one called G1. They're both 10 bits long. And this is for the uh, sort of the simplest carrier acquisition code that we can decode easily with our RTLSDR. First one is called G1, and it has a polynomial that is x to the 10 plus x cubed plus 1. Now, the highest order term in the polynomial tells you uh, how big the uh, shift register is. If we weren't taking a tap from the highest item, there would be no point in having a longer shift register. So let me just draw out what this, what this is. I'm just going to draw 10 little boxes. There's box one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Let me number them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. They're shift registers, so they're all connected up. One to the next, to the next, to the next. Everything's going to shift over by one at every time step. And if I look at this polynomial, it looks like I have to take output 10 and output 3 and X or those together. So here's output 10. That's going to be our, our G1 output. Let me just call that G1. And your G sub 1. And I'm going to take this and form the exclusive or. with output number three. And that is what I will feed back into shift register number one. Now, there's another linear feedback shift register called G2. G2, and its polynomial is much more complicated, just more terms. So it's x to the 10 plus x to the 9 plus x to the 8 plus x to the 6th plus x to the 3, plus x to the 2, plus 1. And again, the plus 1 doesn't really play into the feedback. So here, I have to have a, uh, another 10 registers here. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And they're all shift registers. They're all connected to each other. Everything's going to shift over by one each time. And this output's going to be called G2. And let me number them again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And now we have to form the XOR between many of these different bits. So what does that mean? That means that um, every time one of these is one, the bit flips from a zero to a one. So I could just draw a giant XOR gate. And what are we going to need here? We're going to need 10, 9, and 8. So 10, 9, 8. And we are going to need uh, 6, 3, and 2. So 6, 3, and 2. And I'm going to draw one giant XOR, but you can think of it as being XORs of XORs of XORs. That's the, we wanted to implement it in hardware with a single X, uh, single uh, two bit XORs. That's basically what this is. There's an XOR gate. This is going to be our feedback. Goes back to the beginning. And this is going to give us a different sequence of outputs and a different sequence of states than G1. So let me show you a simulation of these in GNU Radio. OK, so here is my, uh, my GNU Radio simulation. Now, unfortunately, there is something called, if I just search for LFSR, there's something called GLFSR source. And if you go back to the Wikipedia page here, this is actually the different form of the linear feedback shift register called not the Fibonacci, where you take XORs of taps uh, that become the input. That's the form we're using and the form that GPS uses. Um, it is the Galois form 
where the XORs are embedded in here. Uh, it turns out that for the same polynomial, you get the same sequence out. It's just shifted by some arbitrary amount that depends on the length, the number of bits, and the, uh, and the particular polynomial you're using. So we can't use this, this GLFSR source for, for GPS because things will be shifted relative to each other. If I did one of these for G1 and one of these for G2, they wouldn't be the same. Now, there is a Fibonacci linear feedback shift register is just in this thing called Scrambler. So these sequences are used a lot in digital communications for everything from, uh, from error checking to just whitening the signal. So the Scrambler has one of these built in. Uh, the difference is that instead of just taking the feedback, you can actually XOR the feedback with some input. And so for me, I'm just XORing it with the constant source zero that I've throttled for this simulation. So I have a scrambler linear feedback shift register for G1 with polynomial x to the 10 plus x to the three plus one, and another scrambler with the more complicated polynomial for G2. Now let me look, let me show you how you set the parameters of this because this is, this is pretty complicated to get right. And if you're off by a little bit, things will still look kind of right unless you really check it carefully because a random sequence is gonna look kind of random. Uh, and if you don't get it quite right, You'll either get a different random sequence or a sequence that repeats and doesn't have the nice properties of this. So if I go in here, um, I've, I've written it in such a way that can be generalized. So our polynomial is x to the 10 plus x cubed plus one. Um, the length of our shift register is 10, but oddly this block wants you to write one less than the length. So I've written 10 minus one. The seed should be the all one state. So this is what starts when you first start this thing. And if I write the binary number two to the 10 minus one, that, that ends up being one, 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 the, the binary number with five ones, sorry, with 10 ones. So that's, that's the seed. And the mask is what is used internally to, to calculate all the XORs and to do this polynomial math. And here we want our polynomial to be X to the 10 plus X to the three, but I actually have to write it as the binary number two to the, the length here, 10 minus the first item here, minus 10, plus two to the 10 minus the second item. So that's how I that's how I write the, the polynomial as a number that becomes the mask for this internal calculation. Um, if I look at the second one, and that, that just becomes the binary number here in hex, uh, number eight one, and the seed is is all ones, three FF. If I look at the second one, it is more complicated. Let me uh, drag that out. So again, the length is 10 minus one because it wants one less than the actual length. The seed is all ones, it's 10, 10 ones. And here the, the mask is the polynomial. So I, my polynomial was x to the 10, oops, x to the 10, uh, x to the nine, x to the eight, x to the sixth, x to the three, and x to the two. That's how I write this. And this will, generate the, the right sequence. And on the homework, you're gonna change this to be the three bit sequence that we worked out at the beginning of, of the class. All right, so, so what happens now? I'm generating my sequence here, um, and it's actually gonna be the sequence, not, not any mucked up sequence, because I'm, I'm inputting a constant source of zeros. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save that to a stream called G1, uh, I'm gonna add two to it just so I can plot it above the other one. Here, I'm gonna save it to a stream called G2, and I'm just gonna turn these into floats so I can plot them. All right, so that's that's part one. And let me show you the result of that. Uh, let me, well, the plot that we're looking at is the top, the plot on the top here. So I'll look at, I'll show you the other plots in a second. So uh, if I look at the sequence here, so G, G1 is the blue sequence. And again, because the shift register starts off at all ones, the sequence is gonna start off with lots of ones as they shift out of the shift register. And then it starts to oscillate and, and do something that looks somewhat random. Uh, G2 is also gonna start off with a run of all ones, but it's gonna start oscillating in a different way. And it's gonna go exactly one less than two to the 10. So it's gonna go uh, 1,023, items, then it's gonna repeat back to the beginning. So if I zoom in here, see the beginning of the sequence, 
you can see that they both start off as all ones, but then G1 starts to do three zeros and then three ones and three zeros and G2 uh, moves around a little bit more in the beginning. All right, so let me, let me show you these plots of the correlation properties before I show you the part of the flow graph that generates them. So this first plot is, if you just look at the blue, it is the autocorrelation of just G1 with itself. And the, uh, the way we have to generate this, we actually generate it as a complex number. So I have the real part of the autocorrelation and the imaginary part of the autocorrelation. Because this, these are real numbers that we're putting in, the imaginary part is just gonna be always zero. And you can see here, there's one little dot here that's quite high. It's at uh, 1,023 if I zoom in here. Oh. Yeah, if I zoom in here, uh, let me turn off the auto scale so I can zoom in. If I zoom in here, very first, first dot at shift zero is right there at 1,023. And if I zoom in on all the, uh, let me turn auto scale back on. Off. Let me zoom in on all the others here. So down here, you can see that the, the red is always zero, but the blue, the red is always exactly zero there. And the blue is always at negative one. And that blue is gonna be negative one the whole way. So this, this is the, the property that I, that I talked about where the autocorrelation has, is, uh, is one, oh, sorry, is, is the, the N, the length of the sequence for, for no shift and exactly negative one for every possible other shift. Um, now, what I've shown in the last plot is the cross correlation between G1 and G2 to show that these aren't just shifted versions of each other. If they were shifted versions of each other, you would get a spike somewhere somewhere else. They're not shifted versions of each other, they're actually independent sequences. And here, the, the correlation you get doesn't look exactly random, but there are some spikes that go up to 60 and minus 60-ish, 60, uh, 60 by 64, yeah, 64 and minus 64. Uh, and uh, but on average, it's going to be zero, and the correlation between two different sequences is never as high as uh, 1,023. Is never as high as the sequence with one. So how did I generate this? Well, unfortunately, GNU Radio doesn't have a simple circular correlation block, so I had to build it out of the definition of uh, well, out of one one efficient way of calculating the circular correlation with fast Fourier transforms, and I'll just talk about that really, really fast. I'm not going to go into the math, the details, but you can sort of copy and paste this whole sequence whenever you want to do a circular correlation. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, let's look at the cross correlation. That might be a little bit more instructive here. I'm going to take my G1 and my G2 as virtual sources. And I'm going to, right now there, there's a sequence of zeros and ones. So I'm going to map them onto negative one and positive one. And I'm going to turn them into floating point numbers with, with no scaling. And now I'm going to do my correlation. The first thing I have to do is turn them into complex numbers and uh, with the real part zero. And I'm gonna use this thing called stream to vector. So this takes a stream of individual samples and turns it into a block, a vector, a chunk of, of, uh, of samples that, that in this case is gonna be uh, 1,023 long. So up here, I define this thing called vector size as the length of my sequence. 1.023k is just 1,023. And if I look in my stream to vector block, um, I make the number of items this vector size. Okay, so now here's the totally non-intuitive part. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the Fourier transform of each of these chunks. I'm gonna multiply one Fourier transform by its complex conjugate. Then I'm gonna take the inverse Fourier transform of that result. And then I'm just gonna scale it by uh, by one over the, the vector size. And that, oh, and then I'm gonna turn it back into a stream and plot it. And this combination of taking Fourier transforms, uh, multiplying one by the complex conjugate of the other, and then inverse Fourier transforming is actually much more efficient than doing all of those multiplies and adds for every possible circular shift. So that's, that's, how, I, that's how I'm implementing this circular correlation. And we'll use this when we uh, look at the, the GPS satellites. 